Hi everyone, it's David Thompson again with Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. Today I'm joined by Scott Hartwig, who is the Supervisory Park Historian at the Gettysburg National Military Park, and the recent author of To Antietam Creek, The Maryland Campaign of September 1862, which is now out with the Johns Hopkins University Press. So Scott, thanks so much for joining us today. Delighted to be here. Uh, if you would, could you just start us with perhaps a broad overview of this book, which is quite sizable. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, it uh, it begins with George McClellan. The first chapter is devoted to McClellan. So it really begins with McClellan being restored to command. And then it goes back to McClellan uh, coming to Washington after Bull Run. And we we see how McClellan shapes the war in that first chapter and how the war is changing in the first chapter. And then we go through the invasion of Maryland by the Army of Northern Virginia. And uh, the real uh, meat of the book, I would say, is it, it, there's a full treatment of the Harpers Ferry operation, full treatment of the battles of South Mountain, Crampton's Gap, Turner's Gap, Fox's Gap. And then it takes us up to the evening before the Battle of Antietam. So I end the book uh, after the skirmishing on September the 16th, the battle is, is going to begin in the morning, and that's where the book ends. I wonder, how did you decide, you know, how, how, rather, how did you approach such a large topic, you know, because there's such a range of source material and kind of looking, you know, at your acknowledgments, you know, you're pulling from a lot of different places. Some places are close by, such as in Carlisle, but you're pulling mm -hmm. from the Southern Historical Collection as well. How did you kind of conceptually think about this work? understanding that there's just so much material out there to cover this 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 period yeah that, that's a good question um it uh, um i just went after the material i mean i knew places that might have the material and uh i just i just went after i had a lot of people who helped me like when you mentioned the southern historical collection i personally wasn't able to go down there but i had several people who went through the collection and also they were wonderful i would correspond with them about items they had in their collection that I wanted to get. But um, what I tried to do was just be as thorough as I possibly could. W realistically, realizing that I could have researched this for the rest of my life and never written anything. So I, I tried to be realistic about it. And I, and, and I think that you, when you're working on something like this, you reach a point when you, you know that you, you pretty well have the best of the material. There might be one other thing that's going to come through, but that could change your interpretation of something, but that it almost invariably is going to come from a major player. So if I found the papers of Randolph Marcy, for example, maybe that might have changed some of the interpretation in there of George McClellan, but you're not going to find another enlisted man or a line officer that is going to change the interpretation. So you reach a point where you know that you've, you've found enough material to tell the story honestly and, and to the best of your ability. And that's when I think you know that you just have to start writing. And write you did. Um, it comes in at a little under 800 pages uh, when you factor in um, the notes and uh, the bibliography and such and the index. I, I wonder when did you decide, um, and, you, and you note in the work itself that you know there's going to be a second volume on Antietam. When did you decide that you know you could give the rest of the campaign um, its own dedicated work, and that you didn't want to? Was this something that you decided from the get-go, or just really once you got into the material, you realized, wow, there's just so much here that it's impossible to try to do the entire thing in one book? Well. When I first started on this project, and it was so long ago, it was, I think it was like 1865 is when I began. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Um, no, when I first started on the project, I, I wrote, this was even before uh, computers were available to people. So I wrote the whole thing in longhand, and I wrote an entire book on the Maryland campaign and the Battle of Antietam, and it was, it was atrociously bad. Um, <laughs> it was really terrible. And, um, but that was a good experience because it, it, the one thing I learned from doing that is, is that uh, if you're going to do this right, you, you can't do this in one volume. It's impossible. And I'd also read uh, Stephen Sears' book and I'd read Jim Murfin's book and, and I enjoyed both those books. But 
the one thing I noticed about everything that everyone had written about Antietam, even going back to um, uh, Paul Fried's book, The Antietam in Fredericksburg, everything everybody had ever written about Antietam, it, when you tried to write about the campaign, you, you didn't spend any time on Harper's Ferry. You spent a little time on South Mountain, and the, the focus was always the Battle of Antietam, which is understandable. I mean, it was the big, it was the big event, in a way, of the campaign. But I wanted to make sure that those other important parts of the campaign, South Mountain, which is really the first time Robert E. Lee loses a battle, uh, a, a major battle with the Army of Northern Virginia and Harper's Ferry, which which is, um, is is overlooked because it's not a bloodbath. I mean, people love to focus on battles that there's lots of casualties in. But um, I always like to make the point that uh, Jackson's capture of Harper's Ferry, and of course he's not the only guy who orchestrates the capture. You got to include McClaws and Walker in that. But Jackson's capture of Harper's Ferry is is the biggest victory the Confederates win in the war. They they, they take three hundred casualties and they capture twelve thousand men and all these supplies. It's an entire army corps. You know the Union Army does it. Grant does it several times, but. The Confederates, this is the biggest win that they really have. And I think oftentimes people look at Lee's victory at Chancellorsville or they look at Lee's, uh, the seven days. And yes, those were, those were really significant victories and you can make big arguments about how they changed the course of the war, particularly the seven days. But, um, just for a victory that was a huge embarrassment to the North, Harper's Ferry was big. And I thought it was important that people understand, well, what happened at Harper's Ferry? Why, why was Harper's Ferry surrendered? Was it because of the brilliance of the Confederates? Was it because of the ineptitude of the Federals who were defending it? Was it because McClellan failed to relieve Harper's Ferry? So I felt that that, that had to have a thorough treatment. So that was one of the reasons why I knew that if you were going to do a thorough treatment of Harper's Ferry in South Mountain, you, you couldn't do this in one volume or, or no one could carry the book around. <laughs> I can barely carry it around right now. <laughs> that, that is true. Um, did you find your work as a public historian um, kind of playing into this at all when you sat down to actually write and you're sharing this story? Did you think about some of the time that you have spent on not necessarily you know, just at Gettysburg but on battlefields in general and kind of how you relay – a, a narrative to a public? Did that come into play at all as you were writing this story? I think that that played a, a very big role because uh, being a public historian, um, well, I always remember something that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jim Horton, he's a professor at George Washington, I think. Uh, Jim Horton said to me one time, he was up at Gettysburg, and he says, you know, when I'm teaching a course, uh, the students have to be there. And they can't leave. But when you're out on the battlefield here and the public is listening to you, they just walk away from you. They don't have to listen to you. So he says, you have the harder job, which I'm not sure I really agree with, but it was nice of him to say that. But the point of that is, is you learn how to present a narrative that has depth to it, that is honest, but is presented in a way that Everyone who is listening to you, they may not agree with what you're saying, but it's presented to them in a way that draws them into the story. And for those who disagree with you, uh, like, per, for example, on the Gettysburg battlefield, if you're introducing slavery and you're in the National Cemetery and you're talking about this, what this war was about and what Lincoln envisioned for the country, you may have some people on that program who believe the war was about states' rights and the war had nothing to do with slavery. But... You present it in a way that you don't offend them. What you want to do is to get them to start thinking about that. And so I felt that uh, through the years and trying to take complex issues on the battlefield, because uh, some people on, on your programs, they're not interested in finding out, you know, this company wheeled right and, you know, the left flank was at this specific spot and this tactic. So you find ways to help people understand um, maybe complex details of battle actions or tactics in a way that is easy for them to understand. So I think all of that, by, by having to work with the public and helping the public 
uh, understand what the war is about, how battles are fought, all of those things really influenced how I wrote this book. And a question that I know many people, once they finish this volume, will, will be dying to know the answer to. When do you plan on having the second volume out on the Battle of Antietam itself? I, um, I'm hoping to retire at the end of this year okay. from uh, the National Park Service. So that'd be 34 years in the Park Service. Um, so hopefully at the end of this year, I'll retire and then I can spend full time working on the next volume. I'd like to have it done in three to four years. That's that's my goal. I think Johns Hopkins would like it if I could do it in less time, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's possible. I'm, I'm sure they would. I'm sure they would. Uh, now, as we have mentioned here already, uh, you are a uh, supervisory park historian at Gettysburg, um, and obviously this is a very big year for you folks up there with the 150th of the battle this coming July. I was wondering if you might be able to share with some of our viewers kind of some of the highlights that you have mapped out uh, for this year to uh, commemorate the 150th. Yeah, we um, well we're we're approaching the 150th on all fronts. I mean, on the on the battlefield through social media because we realize that in this day and age with social media, we can reach out to people who would love to be here for the 150th but can't be here for the 150th. So we have a, a series of videos that we've shot that are going to take you through the Gettysburg campaign that we'll be posting through our through Facebook. We'll be using our park blog from the fields of Gettysburg to um, to uh, probably present some primary source material about some of the uh, incidents in the Gettysburg campaign. So we'll and we'll use our website also to help people follow along in the campaign up to the battle. For the for the battle anniversary, we've got um, a number of special events that we have planned. So June thirtieth is what we're calling the signature event. There's going to be a um, a special event near where the old Cyclorama Center is located, and that'll be on the evening of June 30th. It, it is going to be professionally produced. There'll be a stage. People are going to be asked to bring their blankets and so on, and, and, and it'll uh, include Doris Kearns Goodwin, who will be uh, as a historian talking about the meaning of Gettysburg, and it'll include a professionally produced uh, program called Voices of Gettysburg, and it'll be various voices of people associated with the battle or commenting about what the battle means um, to bring it all the way up to today to provide some relevancy, but also to hear the voices of people because you're sitting there looking out over the battlefield of people who live the event. And then we're considering our anniversary July 1 through 4. And the reason we're doing that, we know the battle is July 1 through 3, but uh, oftentimes the aftermath of the battle gets forgotten in, in these commemorations. So we want to make sure that that is remembered. So July the 4th, our programming is going to focus on uh, the effect of the battle on civilians, prisoners, the burial of the dead, uh, the wounded. So we look at how did the, the citizens of the country, the citizens of Gettysburg and the armies deal with the aftermath of the battle. During the course of the anniversary of the battle, the three days, We've, we've tried to create programming that is going to, if it's busy, uh, almost anywhere you are, you're going to have an opportunity to experience some programming. So we're going to have two living history camps with uh, a full battalion of Union, full battalion of Confederate, two artillery batteries that will do demonstrations. Um, we'll have programming around our visitor center. So if you don't want to leave your car and you don't want to leave the visitor center, there's going to be programs that are free to the public. And then on the battlefield, we have uh, essentially three tiers of programs. The basic one we're calling key moments. And these will be stations like at uh, Reynolds Woods, uh, the Peace Light, Barlow's Knoll, Cemetery Hill, for example, on the first day. And there'll be regular programs every hour that Rangers will be presenting. It'll be 30 minutes long. that will talk about what happened that day 150 years ago at that location. We'll have overview hikes. These will be about 60 to 90 minute walks that take you through a part of the battlefield each day that give you a little bit broader overview or deeper overview of, of what happened. And then we'll have what we're calling battlefield experience programs. These are um, for our, you know, it, it's not just for the veteran visitor to the battlefield, but 
They're, they're intended to be programs that we may never do again. For example, at 10 o'clock on July 2nd, we're going to do a program at Meade's headquarters about the Council of War, and we'll open the headquarters up for that. Well, we're never going to do that again. At 6 a.m. on July the 3rd, we're going to do Lee and Longstreet, maybe it's 6.30. <laughs> uh, we're going to do a program at Lee and Longstreet and a decision to make Pickett's Charge. We want to put people on the battlefield at the time certain really key decisions were made at that place, those things happened. We'll recreate the final march of the Iron Brigade from the Kadori Farm out to the first day's battlefield on July the 1st. We're also trying to do them at times that they don't have a big impact upon traffic and it's going to be easier for people to get to them. So um, we have a lot going on. We'll, we'll post all this on the website as well. It certainly sounds like it sounds like it's going to be a very exciting couple of days, and I know many people, I'm sure many of our viewers, um, are hoping to make it there uh, for the for this very special occasion. Um, curious question that I have, and I know some other people have since I mentioned I was going to be speaking with you. Do you have a favorite spot on the battlefield? I really don't. Um... There's so many places in the battlefield I like to go, and I do go to quite a few because um, my wife and I have a Brittany, and uh, Brittany's need a lot of exercise. So I'm always looking for some new place in the battlefield that I can that I can walk the dog. Um, East Cavalry Field is a is a really great place to go. Hardly anybody ever goes out and visits it. The southern end of the battlefield is such an interesting, unique landscape that. Um, it, it's uh, that's definitely one of my favorite places, but I love the first day's battlefield as well. Um, I spent a lot of time out there. And finally, Scott, I don't want to take up too much of your day here on your day off. Um, I don't know if you've had some time in between writing the, this book to be reading some other civil war books as of late, but is there a book that you've read recently that's kind of stuck out to you that you would recommend to our viewers? Um, I really enjoyed Gary Gallagher's The Union War. It's a short book, but I think it's an important book, and I thought that he he brought some needed um, re-emphasis on the importance of how soldiers in the Union Army saw preserving the Union, how important that was to soldiers in, in the Union Army. So I, I enjoyed that book. I thought it was well-written and uh, easy to get through. Yeah, very well-written, and as you mentioned, it's a little bit on the shorter end, which is always nice as well. Sometimes it's kind of refreshing not to imply that your book is too long, but it's, sometimes it's nice to have a, right. yes. a, a shorter work to make. It <laughs> uh, well, Scott, thank you so much for joining us today, for sharing a little bit about your book. Again, that is To Antietam Creek, The Maryland Campaign of September 1862, which is now out, uh, as I said before, with the Johns Hopkins University Press. I highly recommend it. It is worth the read, everyone. I know it may seem a little daunting when you see the, the total page numbers, but it's a fantastic read, a much-needed work on the build-up to the actual Battle of Antietam. And uh, I, for one, can't wait for the second volume on the actual battle itself. Uh, so hopefully we can get you through the 150th and into retirement so you can chip away at that, Scott. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs>